My fellow fallible humans, this is the Red Roof Recovery Show, a program to soften the path of recovery from substance and or behavioral addictions. I've been on my own recovery journey since 2009. I use a variety of tools and techniques that I'll be sharing with you on every episode of the Red Roof Recovery Show. And the reason this program is called Red Roof Recovery is because the roof symbolizes the hundreds of therapies that are available to us in our recovery journey. The red roof symbolizes the power of the color red. It's my favorite color as well. And it also represents love, energy, and passion. And many spiritual traditions as well, they consider red to be very healing and grounding. Today's topic on the Red Roof Recovery Show is about how our perception colors our communication. One of my favorite definitions of truth is a fundamental reality defined by a person's perceived experience. So this should be a a fun conversation today. I'm grateful to have as my guest with us, Lance Lickfold. Lance is my partner of 30 years, who, as luck would have it, happens to have the day off from the evil empire for which he works in Toronto, because we're recording this on Canada Day, which is a stat holiday for some. Nice to have you here, Lancelot. Welcome to the Red Roof Recovery Show. Thanks for uh, inviting me or cajoling me. I'm not sure. (laughs) So Lancelot, I call you my Lancelot because of everything that that uh, brings with it. But I want to just give people a little bit of a background on us being together for 30 years because it's nothing short of a miracle. I give him all the credit, absolutely, um, because, you know, I've been told by all of my previous partners until I got married that I was very difficult to uh, live with. So I commend you for putting up with me for this long. That's my perception. Absolutely. And, you know, I'm always learning about communication. Uh, My father always used to say to me, it's not what you say, Tanya, it's how you say it. So I'm aware of that all the time. And of course, awareness is the key to uh, correcting a bad behavior, right? Being aware of it first and then be willing to do the work to correct it. So we were having a conversation this morning as we were having our beverage together, uh, talking about what I would be talking about on the Red Roof Recovery Show for this episode. And I thought, you know, this is a wonderful opportunity for us to actually be together to talk about how we got together and how communication affects, uh, you know, all of our perceptions and experience. So where would you like to start? The fact that I didn't take your name when we got married. Which didn't sit well with my father, as you can imagine. Oh my goodness, we could have another show about that. Yes. Yes. And I couldn't understand why, Mm -hmm. being from the UK, until you told me why the connotation that my name, Lickfold, holds for Canadians. Right. So, you know, I mean, a lot of people who didn't have their mind in the gutter perhaps would think, oh, yeah, Lickfold. And think of envelopes, Lickfold. However. (laughs) It didn't really dawn on me until I worked at one company and everyone over the Tanai was Stephen Bailey, please come to reception. Mick Smythe, please come to reception. Lance, please come to reception. And I asked the the lady at reception, why do you not use my last name? She said, I can't say that word. And that's when it dawned on me that my my name in Canada held some negative connotation to do with certain <laughs> activities female anatomy, yes. <laughs> in the bedroom. So in the UK, this never came up. Never in my 30 years in the UK did anyone. And so I came to realize that communication in Canada was going to be different than communication in the UK. Even though we perceive ourselves as having the same language, having the same backgrounds, as you often say, Mm. this was once a dominion of the UK. But our perceptions, our life experiences in that color our, the way we react to people, the way we react to names. Absolutely. And when we were, and we can't even say we were courting because we only knew each other for seven days Yeah. Uh, when I proposed to him and, uh, you know, a lot of reasons behind that, but um, I had a list of 
I'm not kidding. I had a written list of the kind of uh, characteristics I was looking for in a lifetime partner. And lo and behold, Lancelot here filled uh, the bill for me. Uh, it was the name. <laughs> it was like, no, no way I can, I can take that name. Of course, you know, and put it together with Lance, Lance Lickfold. It's a perfect porn star name, right, as well. <laughs> as when I was working in New York, Patch, some guy found out my name and said, can I use your name? It's the best porn star name going. <laughs> Again, is. something that I never right. put together. All of those perceptions and judgments. Absolutely. So when we were uh, getting married, when we made the decision to get married, and my father, who never had anything negative to say about anything or anyone for my lifetime at that point, and he had only met Lance the one time and I told him I took him out to dinner and I said dad I'm, I'm getting married and he said oh god please tell me it's not to the Englishman and I was shocked but then I reflected a little bit about I'm from Cape Breton Nova Scotia a small coal mining town called Glace Bay and our exposure to British people at that point wasn't positive and that again, what colored the perception of my father, who never had a negative thing or word to say about anybody. It shocked me when he said that. And I said, Dad, and of course, you know, the name McIntyre, it's a Scottish-Irish background, and there's all of that, um, I guess... Conflict? Yeah, I said, for <laughs> lack of a better word, uh, conflict from, you know, hundreds, thousands of years ago with you know, our ancestors, I guess. And sure enough, when Lance got back to England and said he was marrying a McIntyre, what did your parents say? First of all, I couldn't believe I would marry someone after knowing them for seven days. And then there's the whole Scottish English thing. Right. Like, yeah. mm -hmm. And you hadn't been married. Why has you been married? Why not? There must be something wrong with you. Again, perception that where I came from, everyone got married young. I come from a very working class, as you all know, background in Essex in the UK. And everyone that I knew, if you were married at 25, you'd left it a long time. Mm. So for a woman of 30 years old, never been married, no children, what's wrong with her? That was their question again, perception, and trying to communicate there was nothing wrong with you. <laughs> you know, you just hadn't met the right person, you had a career, things happen. But that wasn't in their, their scope of knowledge. Right. And then the other judgment that comes with uh, have made, having made a, a choice early on in my life not to have children. Mm -hmm. The judgment that came with that, because your family was all about family. How could a woman possibly not want children? What's wrong with her again? Yeah, there's mm -hmm. a perception. And your perception of me being a reason we're still together. I was married before. I have three children, eight grandchildren, and I was married. And she left me for someone else. So for her, I wasn't that great. So your perception and her perception are two totally different things. You come from different spaces. You, you're wrong when you say it's all me. It's a two-way street. Well, again, that's a perception that you have, you know, communicated to me quite often that mm -hmm. it's a wrong perception. And I appreciate that. But for sure, you are the most considerate, patient person that I know. And I, I attribute those qualities for sure for, for going a long way to uh, tolerating sometimes my, you know, headstrong type A personality that, uh, you know, sometimes it's my way or the highway kind of attitude. Yeah, but it wanes after a while. <laughs> You're very, as you put it, Scottish. The, the instant, and then it's gone. Mm -hmm. so. Which is why I always suggest that uh, when you're heightened emotionally, um, you know, oftentimes I was self-medicating those heightened emotions with drugs and alcohol. So now that I'm not using drugs and alcohol as my anesthetic through which I endure the operation of life, uh, I find other ways to 
self-medicate that with cognitive behavioral therapy, rational emotive behavioral therapy, uh, motivational enhancement therapy. I mean, there are literally hundreds of things that you can use, uh, but I think key is being aware of the behavior first and then having, as you know, my my mentor, I talk about him all the time, Dr. David Burns, uh, who has this book, Feeling Good, The New Mood Therapy, The Clinically Proven Drug-Free Treatment for Depression. I highly recommend this. It's helped me a great deal. It's my other Bible. And he followed up with another book called Feeling Great. So I encourage you to check out Dr. Burns, feelinggood.com. He is uh, one of the pioneers in the development of cognitive behavioral therapy. And I love him dearly for his work. So just to review the principles of cognitive uh, therapy, uh, according to Dr. David Burns, Our positive and negative feelings do not result from what happens in our lives, but rather from our thoughts about what's happening or what has happened. So for instance, we just have moved from one city to a a town and we had a tenant living in the house and she left and left the place in what I considered to be... um, inconsiderate. I mean, it was just left in a, in a tip, I thought. But that's my standard of what I would do, how I would behave if I were leaving somebody's property after having rented it for a year. I wouldn't dream of leaving it in the state that it was left. However, you are wonderful to counterbalance that judgment in me by saying... It depends on your point of reference. As in, as I say, I come from a housing estate in the UK where people would leave their houses and if they were feeling upset, they would actually coat the walls with excrement and trash the place. Moving out, people used to leave basically anything they didn't want and take anything they did want, as in light bulbs and stuff like that. So if you're coming from a point of reference there, and you have 10 garbage bags full of thing and the place hasn't been swept, that's no big deal. But if you're used to coming from somewhere where cleaners have been in and everything's perfect and you come into a place with 10 garbage bags, it's a big deal. So your point of reference has to be, there's nuances within our learned experience. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Oh, my, my dad always used to say that good judgment comes from experience and or experience comes from bad judgment and good judgment comes from experience, right? It's a, it's a full circle kind of thing. And you're right. I mean, she's half my age and, um, you know, I, I made the mistake of um, dealing with that heightened emotion in a communication to her that I now regret, which is why I didn't take, you know, I always say, take your own advice, Tanya. And I didn't take my own advice by letting heightened emotions just sit with them. And if you're wanting to write something and express an emotion to somebody, you can do it, but let it sit in draft. Whether you're writing an email, typing a text, whatever, just let it sit in draft until you can process those emotions and then revisit it maybe in 24 hours. Nine times out of 10, I I think you would change your mind and not send it. And if I had taken my own advice, I would never have sent the text that I sent to her. And I sent it without even reading my emails first. So she had sent me an email when she had left at 2 a.m. the night before explaining why she had left it in such a state. So talk about a communication snafu. Huge, right? And I mean, now that's caused a rift between us that we may never be able to recover from. And I'm, I feel really bad about that. So what do you do when you, when you, you learn from it, you learn, right? How do you learn from that? Take my own advice, let it sit in draft for heaven's sake. Mm-hmm. So another principle of cognitive therapy from Dr. David Burns, depression and anxiety result from distorted, illogical, misleading thoughts. What you're telling yourself is simply not true. So, for instance, what I just said about you, I give you all the credit for keeping our relationship together for 30 years. But that's not true, is it? Because a partnership is, by definition, two people 
working their way through the trials and tribulations of life. You've supported me in hundreds of ways. Now you say that they're not as important as what I do. I don't see it that way because without those, your support in certain areas, I would not be where I am today. So, you know, is one more in one way, like is financial support more important than uh, mental support is, you know, it depends again on your point of reference. Mm -hmm. I once heard a really good quote, and I'm going to have to paraphrase here because I don't remember it exactly, but it was, measuring a relationship with a scoreboard never works because it's impossible to live up to the subjective calculations of another person. Okay. Plus, it, it sort of mirrors social media nowadays. If you're keeping a scoreboard and something happens five, ten years down, down the road, and you bring that score from ten years to an argument that you've, you're having now, you're doomed to failure. Hmm. It's just, you can't do that. You have to deal with whatever it is, and addiction is the same thing. You have to deal with that moment, process it, and move on. If you store that in a little compartment back there to bring out when you need it or whatever, you're doomed. Well, I remember telling you that my, what my father said about you know how shocked I was when my own dad said that about, please tell me it's not to the Englishman. How did that make you feel? Like, how did you not carry that judgment to when you saw my dad again? Because I would have held that grudge for a while. <laughs> for Actually, sure. I found it. I took it as a challenge to get him to like me. Mm. I knew he'd like me in the end. I'm a likable guy. <laughs> Where do you get that confidence? Where does that come from? I don't know. Mm. I don't know. You were an athlete you know, when you were younger. Perhaps, I, yeah, I was very much the an mindset athlete. of athletes, I find, is is different, I think. Maybe because of the camaraderie, you, you have to get along with people. But don't forget, when we met, I was an introvert. Mm -hmm. I had the internal confidence, but I would never do this. Never. It's only the last five or maybe ten years that I could actually sit, not only audio, but visual as well. That That was so far out of my comfort zone. Even standing up in town hall meetings at work and bringing up some situations that I could never do it. Walking into a place, when I was younger and I would go to nightclubs, I was, I'd been divorced, I was the oldest person, and we'd walk into nightclubs and I'd look around and all my younger friends would be five paces behind. And I'd say to them, why? Why, why are you... And they said, because you walk into a place like you own it. Now, some people find that threatening. Some people find it endearing. Again, it depends on your point of reference. Mm. But there was an internal confidence that I like me. I think that's the... Yeah. Well, maybe you should write a book about how we can all get there without drugs and alcohol. Because I know lots of people who would walk into a room like they owned it, but they were, you know, most of them were dealing with a substance use disorder. Well, my... my, <laughs> my, my uh, the brother next to me, he, the, the younger brother, he was the most liked person in the pub where I grew up. Everyone liked Rick. But Rick couldn't walk into that pub without at least five shots inside him. He, he didn't have a self-confidence in people like me because I'm likable. He had to be gregarious, and the only way he could do that, because our family tends to be introverted, both my parents were, intro were introverts, um, he needed what we used to call Dutch courage. And he'd take five shots, and then he'd walk in and do the whole, hi, how is everyone? So I can understand why people go down that road. If, if, you, if you want to be liked, and you don't feel like you're going to be liked, and a substance loosens you up. I can understand the, the pull of that. Well, they call alcohol social lubricant for a reason, right? This is true. The third principle of cognitive therapy from Dr. David Burns, when you change the way you think, you can change the way you feel. 
And this can usually happen rapidly and without drugs and alcohol. Changing the way you think can change the way you feel. Do you believe that? Definitely. As, as you know, I tend to get little bouts of depression. And there's no rhyme or reason for it. There's no catalyst. It's just what I think about my situation, as you put it, the evil empire, where I do not enjoy working, but they, they pay relatively well. And certain social situations that I can't change, and instead of dismissing them and saying, well, I can't change any of this, and I let them get on top of me. So changing your mindset certainly changes outcomes for you, I think. Mm. Yeah. So did you have to change your mindset around that confidence? Or do you, I don't, you didn't really answer the question about where that confidence came from, especially because you were raised by two introverts. My father, used, he had a saying when, when I was younger. And I, as I worked for him, I realized that he didn't really believe it himself, but he installed it into us kids, was that no one's better than you, but you're no better than anyone else. We're all the same. Whether you've got $2 billion in a bank or you're sitting on the street, we're all human beings. So if you, if you look at it as a level playing field, because most of our insecurities come from not within us, as in I'm not good enough, it's I'm not good enough for you. Mm. Well, you actually, I think, said that. You were Very feeling so. um, a little self-conscious around who you perceived to be. Yes friends who were how did you kind of categorize we, I, that i was working in germany and we were corresponding and you you said to me oh i was out last night and you went through the list of people who were there and they were university professors and well-known musicians and i was just a guy from essex who was a, a mill rat hadn't read a book back then didn't think i was that smart and uh, I communicate to you, I think this may not work because I will not be able to swim in the same pool that you seem to be swimming in. Wow, that's, that's powerful language. Yeah. And you said no. And then I, and don't forget, I, I hadn't been exposed to people in Hollywood who had had higher education, who were managers, people like that. I, I'd never been exposed to these people. So my point of reference was that these people were really, really smart and I wasn't that dumb. I was confident that if they met me, they'd like me, but could I converse with them on an equal level? Um, I wasn't sure. So where did the confidence come from? Where, where, where did you become more sure that you could play on a level playing field if that's... I think a lot of that comes through age. You have more life experience, you meet more people. But I think the big one was when we moved to Spain. And I was the project manager dealing with people who could afford multi, multi, multi million dollar yachts, who ran big companies, and you'd have to deal with them. And they were extremely good at making money. But when you actually converse with them about other things, they weren't that smart. Some of them were quite well educated, some were just smart making money. And I realized that, again, the perception of someone who has lots of being that much better is false. Mm. So I was, I was moving through age and meeting more people to actually come to this conclusion, but that just expedited the fact that I realized that people are people and you meet people that you don't like because they're not nice people. And you meet people that you do like because they're nice people. But to evaluate someone because they're rich, poor, or that as being a nice person or a bad person, I just feel it's wrong. Mm. It kind of brings to mind um, a joke that I heard about a plumber doing some work at a doctor's house. And he was just finishing up when the doctor came home. And he said, oh, you're just in time. Uh, just finished up, and here's my invoice. And the doctor looked at it, and he said, oh, my God. He said, I'm a doctor, and I don't make that kind of money. And the plumber said, neither did I when I was a doctor. <laughs> I love 
that joke. Oh, Lancelot, thank you so much for being here with me today. I really appreciate it. And uh, thanks, thanks for putting up with me for 30 years. It means a lot. Thanks for and putting I'm, up I'm with happy me. to say that after three decades with you, not only do I still love you, but I still really, really like you. I think that's a big key, liking, liking the person that you're with. I mean, we can all love things that are not good for us, as you well know. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And thank you for hanging out with us for 30 minutes of your time. I'm very grateful to have found Team CBT from my mentor, Dr. David Burns, a clinically proven evidence-based program created by Dr. Burns, who is a pioneer in the development of cognitive behavior therapy. And Team CBT, CBT being cognitive behavior therapy, uses a detailed format of techniques and tools to reprogram our core beliefs that are contributing to things like habits, addictions, illnesses, and various brain disorders. I'm going to do some shameless self-promotion now. I've authored two books now in honor of my philosopher dad. The first one is Mindful Wisdom from My Philosopher Dad. They're both available on Amazon.ca too, by the way. It's a tribute to my father. He raised me and my baby sister as a single father back in the 60s. And my philosopher dad taught me that the transition to adulthood can often be a bumpy ride. We are essentially really just psychological children, right? Trying to fill emotional voids that were not fulfilled perhaps while we were growing up or otherwise. And we're dealing with social and co cultural conditioning that's always demanding that we behave a certain way. We watch, read, and listen to messages from mainstream media telling us that we're never good enough until we go out and buy something or take something to feel better. And we're living in an economy right now that perpetuates slavery to work and debt. I wrote Mindful Wisdom from my philosopher dad to offer some mindful wisdom to navigate this often mindless maze of life. And my second book, is called Daily Wisdom from My Philosopher Dad. It was self-published in 2021, and it was my way of dealing with my own anxiety around this pandemic. The Daily Wisdom book has been inspired by a few things, uh, from my desire to make my first book the beginning of a series for My Philosopher Dad. He's an extraordinary man. He was, rest in peace, Daddy. Uh, he deserves a legacy of greatness. And if I can do that for him, then, it's been a good life purpose for me. And it's also come from my daily readings that motivate me to continue on my journey of recovery from drugs and alcohol and a few other unhealthy addictions. In 2009, I made my decision to make better choices to live a sober, healthier life. And then a lot of the daily reflections in my daily wisdom book come from my philosopher dad, as I said, single dad, and also from Dr. David Burns, feelinggood.com. Can't rec recommend him enough. My hope is that you will not only buy my books, but that you'll also take a few minutes every day and contemplate those daily wisdom messages. And then maybe write your thoughts and intentions for the day. The power of words is powerful, and the power of the written word is quite often magical and transformational. I'm your host. Tanya McIntyre. And this beautiful theme song that you're listening to is Greatest Bravery. It's from the CD titled The Master Key, and it's from my friend, my mentor, a very talented singer, songwriter, musician, artist, Russell Allen Scott. Thank you, Russell. My wish for you is to always live fully, laugh often, love always, stay positive. May the force be with you, and remember, you are the force. Thank you. Thank you.